So um, this presentation is within the framework of the ERC starting grant nota, note taking and notebooks as channels of medieval academic dissemination across Europe. The general aim uh, of the project is to assemble and study a corpus of multi-text manuscripts stemming from the medieval faculties of theology of 14th and 15th century Europe, which are witnesses to the practice of note-taking in the late Middle Ages. Uh, two methodological issues will be addressed uh, in today's talk the possibility of an operational or pragmatic definition for the concept of medieval notebook, and a possible set of criteria that could be applied to recognize such artifacts and include them in a coherent corpus. A good point to begin the discussion is Friedrich Lindemann's characterization of the notebooks of Ademar of Chaban, which are preserved in the manuscript Leiden University Library, Bosianus Latinus, Octavo 15. Lindemann is the editor of Christian's Opera Minora. One of the witnesses he used when editing the Preexercitamina is precisely this manuscript. Uh, so the quote from Lindemann that I'm about to give is mentioned in the book of Ad Van Els, um, A Man and His Manuscripts, The Notebooks of Ademar of Chaban. And the translation is his, uh, you have the Latin on the slide, and I quote. For there are found in this manuscript so many inconsistencies, so many worthless things, so many trivialities, so many distortions, and so much that is worn out that one hardly knows where to find the patience to examine it all painstakingly. We will circle back to these notebooks. Although they are not directly interesting for the project, they are useful in sketching a possible definition for the concept of notebook. So uh, what do we call a notebook for the 14th, 15th centuries? And most importantly, why? Before presenting some criteria for recognizing medieval notebooks and establishing a corpus, let's take the time and see what words were used in the actual Middle Ages to name notebooks. And then look at four cases uh, where the word notebook is used by our contemporaries to refer to medieval manuscripts. So the presentation will have three parts, answering three questions. What words were used in the Middle Ages to name notebooks? What kinds of manuscripts are called notebooks in contemporary literature? And what criteria are we, are we using to establish the nota corpus? So uh, there are some words which are used in the Middle Ages to refer to notebooks. Quaternus and libellus seem to be the most common. Uh, both also have strict codicological meaning, but every now and again, one finds them to have the meaning of sheets of paper bound together, at least temporarily used for notes, which is probably the easiest definition for a medieval notebook. Um, Quaternus or Quaternus, according to the vocabulary of intellectual life in the Middle Ages, is, uh, and I quote, a gathering of several folded bifolia used for notes. This has led to the expression caterno scribere, which means to take notes from a lecture. Um, there are some diminutives, uh, quaternulus, quaterniunculus, and quaterniolus, that also named uh, loose choirs and small booklets. Um, libellus, libellulus, and liberculus, on the other hand, uh, are more than just the diminutives of liber. They seem to have uh, the same meaning as quaternus, at least in pragmatic terms. So they have the same meaning in that they same, serve the same purpose. Um, just to give one example of uh, when libellus is used by a medieval author. It is found in the manuscript Frankfurt, Stadt und Universität Bibliothek, um, manuscript number 102. Um, in fact, the Cologne student that assembled it, Servatus Fankel, says that he is the collector of that notebook. And uh, I quote, Frater Servatus Fankel, Ordo Predicatorum, Tomista, Collector Huius Liberi. Uh, the manuscript was studied by Gabriel Leur in 1926 and uh, Martin Hunan in the 2011 article Nominalism in Cologne, the student notebook of the Dominican Servatius Fankel. 
The notebook has 250 disputes and 176 folios registered between 1475 and 1488. Among disputes, the manuscript also registers names of doctors and students active in Cologne during that period. The lists are annotated with biographical information, such as the doctrinal orientation, uh, when the people named disputed certain questions, uh, when they became masters, and this kind of information. It is on this list that Servatius names himself, specifies that he is a Thomist and the one who collected the libellus. So although the presence of these words, quaternus and uh, its diminutives, libellus and uh, the other diminutives might indicate that the manuscript is a notebook, their use is neither a necessary nor a sufficient condition. So uh, let's go to the second sec section. What kinds of manuscripts are called notebooks in contemporary literature? My aim here is to showcase that it is acceptable to name a certain composite uh, manuscript notebook, mostly due to their uh, more personal nature, even though they are not called uh, by their owners, either Libelli or Quaterni, uh, and even if they don't come from an academic milieu. So let us circle back to the notebooks of Ademar of Shaban. Um, as I said, they were studied by Advan Els in the book that I mentioned earlier, A Man and His Manuscripts, the notebooks of Ademar of Shaban. Um, I'll repeat the manuscript they are bound in. Uh, it's Leiden University Library, Vosianus Latinus Octavo. Um, so Ademar collected some material that he considered he could reuse to teach his own students. So again, the purpose uh, defines the notebook. The manuscript has 65 texts and some drawings and allows one to observe a tangible witness of the reception and transmission of knowledge. This again seems definitory for a notebook. Uh, the definition um, Ad Van Els works with is that given by James O'Donnell in his article Retractions, uh, where a notebook is defined as, and I quote, an open-ended collection created and arranged for its usefulness to the owner author, making sense purely in terms of the owner's author's needs. So this better explains Lindemann's difficulties when dealing with uh, this manuscript. And actually it explains our own difficulties when faced with uh, this kind of manuscript, because we are somehow supposed to understand the intentions of people who lived some 500 years ago. Um, these notebooks, uh, those of Ademar of Shaban, have three main characteristics. They come from scholarly activities, register what was happening in the classroom. They are personal, uh, organized according to the interests of their owner, and they say something about the circulation of knowledge. Uh, they do not all come from notes that Ademar took in the classroom. Some of them have full text that he copied in the libraries he visited, such as Pritianus's Prexit. Uh, which was uh, mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. The next manuscript that I would like to draw your attention to is mentioned by Pavel Sokup in the article Antifusite Text in the Miscellaneous and Other Manuscripts, the case of the Erfurt Charter House. It is described among a series of mid 15th century personal miscellanies that reflect the interests and efforts of a single person, and it is called a rapiarius. Um, a rapularius, rapiarius, or rapiarium is a manuscript that unites excerpts from uh, works that monks considered useful. It can also name a collection of sentences jotted down by pupils under dictation. The definition on the slide. Uh, refers to a different rapiarium than the one mentioned in the quoted article, but still it's a definition. It should probably apply to more than one uh, case. So um, among these rapiaria from the Erfurt Charter House, Sukup uh, mentions the rapularius compiled by Heinrich Stocke in the 1420s and 1430s. The only copy of this rapularius that has made its way to us comes from the 1450s and was enriched by uh, someone else. The volume is alphabetical. It contains excerpts from other authors. It presents itself like a lexicon, but unlike a lexicon, it also records Henrik's memories and travel records. Pavel Sokup calls this a personal notebook and remarks that uh, personal miscellanies are both um, 
personal and paradoxically communal. They are meant to be accessible to other members of the community, thus the alphabetical organization, which would not really uh, um, um, make sense in, uh, in a different um, context. Uh, the manuscript referred to is Wolfgang Buttel, Herzog August Bibliothek, uh, number one, 139 from the University of Hampshire. Um, another interesting example uh, is mentioned by Ota Pavlicek in the article Ipsa Dicit Kotsikes Ergo Verum, Authority of Scripture, the Use and Sources of Biblical Citations in the Works of Jerome of Prague. And I'm quoting uh, him. During his lifetime, Jerome of Prague was known to record important authorities and arguments encountered in his studies at Oxford, Paris, and elsewhere in a notebook specially acquired for this purpose. Uh, this, this volume of his is mentioned as uh, Pavlicek illustrates in an explicit of the manuscript from Vienna, number 4483 at folio 77b, verso. Uh, and uh, the mention was also published in uh, the edition of Jerome's of Prague, Questio Duplex. Last but not least, uh, let's take another look at the uh, notebook of Servantius Funkel. Uh, as I said, it was studied by Leur uh, in the book Die Theologische Disputationen und Promotionen an der Universität Köln in 1926, and by Martin Funen, who discusses the Disputatio Vacantitialis in his article Nominalism in Cologne, the student notebook of the Dominican Servatius Funkel. It is presented by Hunen as being the result of the student's obligation to attend disputations and take notes. The intention is presumably so that these notes have their own, so that these students have their own arguments for when they have to engage in disputes. Um, Hunan mentioned several similar manuscripts that he calls notebooks, and which are actually the result of a student taking notes from disputes. Um, it is worth mentioning that the notes from Funko's notebook are second order notes. Um, the choirs were not in the classroom, but Hunan argues that they were recorded in a short time after having been disputed, uh, being written down initially on some provisional sheets. The fact that they were written down shortly after having been disputed applies at least for the questiones vacantiales, vacantiales uh, that are recorded in the notebook, because these were held every week between the 28th of June and the 15th uh, of September. And it seems that Servatius tried to write one disputation down before having to attend another one. So what would the specificity with, for this notebook be? Uh, it belongs to a student and gives evidence of the university life in the late 15th century Cologne. It is personal. Servatius makes it for himself. Uh, and its contents are quite uh, varied. My question would be, what do these four examples have in common and how come they can be in the same category? And I would uh, uh, launch the hypothesis that this is possible if we create some subcategories. Um, because student notebooks that register the disputations from the perspective of a student who took part in them are different from miscellaneous that we call notebooks only because of their personal nature. Uh, and um, the subcategories should probably pay attention to the contents of uh, the manuscript. This being said, I'm going to uh, go to the third uh, part of my presentation, uh, namely the one that tries to answer the question, that uh, um, answers the question, what criteria are we using to establish a corpus? So there are three criteria for restricting and regulating the extent of the corpus of manuscripts that are to constitute the subject of our inquiry based on provenance, chronology, and genre. Um, the first criterion regarding provenance narrows the search to the faculties of theology, as these are a good place to launch an investigation on how knowledge was formed and disseminated by uh, means of note taking. It was one of the superior faculties, meaning that the note takers had uh, reached intellectual maturity, offering notes of better quality than those of students in liberal arts. 
This also means that the students themselves were more likely to hold on to these particular notes, giving us a much needed empirical data. The second criterion um, regarding data composition targets the 14th and 15th centuries as ideal time frames for the study of such notebooks. It is easier to find material for these centuries due to, to the generalization of the use of paper. It is also more interesting to look at notes coming from those centuries because lectures on the four books of the sentences of Peter Lombard had been well established as a practice and the young universities of Central and Eastern Europe were beginning their own textual traditions. Paper seems essential for the type of notes that interest us, given that prior to its widespread use, Notes were mainly written on the margins of books because writing materials, mainly parchment, were expensive and hard to come by. So paper allowed for more diligent and systematic note taking. The third criterion uh, differ differentiates between a notebook and other types of composite texts, such as miscellaneous, florilegia, or even medieval encyclopedias. First of all, uh, notebooks are characterized by heterogeneity. They contain multiple texts and fragments of texts, a large variety of notes, or sometimes um, a longer continuous lecture jotted down over an entire academic year, but still there's variety here. Uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, they bear witness to how an individual understood a lecture and the events surrounding it. Um, thus offering researchers a better grasp of the pedagogical practice at medieval universities. We must, however, keep in mind that it is the reduced length of the fragments that helps us differentiate between a simple miscellany and a notebook. Secondly, notebooks tend to be personal, reserved for personal use, not for publication, nor for simple collection within a library. So they will be either autographs, partial autographs, or text copied for an author. The only condition is that their main purpose is not that of enriching somebody's library, but that of helping a scholar with some university work. Even in cases where the notebooks are written by a secretary, the individual interested in them usually intervenes by making corrections or adding marginal notes. Thirdly, the page of the manuscript is divided into zones allowing for lengthy remarks, additions, and even counter arguments to what is being said in the main body of the text. Finally, they show signs of being produced in the classroom or of being a byproduct of studying. Not all of these conditions are necessary at the same time, but we can say that a manuscript is a notebook and can include it in the corpus if it fulfills most of these conditions. Um, I would like to add that uh, the manner of constructing this corpus is quite risky. The criteria are based on hypothesis and preliminary research, so we risk overlooking important elements by not including text that would be essential for the outcome of the project, or on the contrary, by including text that should not have been included. However, the potential gain of such an endeavor is worth it, given that it provides unique insights into the medieval classroom and its practices in a systematic manner. Uh, these criteria are not set in stone. The empirical research takes precedence over them. A criterion might be excluded or another included depending on where the data takes us. It is through this flexible methodology which is characterized by hermeneutic availability that the NOTA project will address any potential difficulties that it will encounter. So uh, thank you. Uh, and I am waiting for uh, your uh, remarks. Thank you, Alexandra, for this stimulating lecture. I can guess, I can imagine that there are a lot of questions. I see already one raised hand by Anne Blair. Please, Anne, feel free to pose your question. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, I was wondering if you could offer a bit more detail about what are the signs of being produced in the classroom, other than, of course, mentioning this fact. Do you feel that there are other formal or material clues that we could, we could look for? Uh, yes, actually. Uh, and 
Um, they are mentioned in the secondary literature. Uh, William Duba in his wonderful uh, book, The Rise of Scotism at the University of Paris, mentions them when he proves that uh, the reportatio that he is working on uh, actually uh, is written on the sex terms that were in the uh, classroom. And his, um, his um, um, arguments are as follows. Um, the sense of the original reportage, right? At the beginning of each class, uh, the writing is more compact and it becomes uh, more loose uh, as uh, uh, the note taker uh, carries on. Uh, then the text has corrections, but um, obviously it do doesn't correct any homo teleuta ever, any sort of because that's the sign of being copied. Uh, then, um, uh, there are spaces left for the titles of the questions because somebody was trying to write down really fast and the titles of the questions can be filled in later. Also, other things that can be filled in later are left uh, blank. Then um, there are, in some lucky cases, there are signs that uh, he was following an oral lecture and uh, Dupa gives a very good example. When somebody starts writing cotidia with a Q, uh, with a, a, a Q and a, a U O double D, and then he realizes that the lecturer was saying cotidia. Um, and uh, if one studies the text uh, with more attention, uh, first order notes from a medieval classroom will have a certain type of abbreviations, namely the ones that. Uh, uh, are made with the least number of strokes, right? So you won't find many abbreviations for Iste. You'll find a lot of Hile, even when uh, the difference between an Iste and a Hile would be essential. Um, also, uh, you find Ideo instead of Ergo and Digito because Ideo is abbreviated with less uh, strokes um, of the pen. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Uh, Yarik. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you, Alexandra, for your presentation. I was especially surprised about the uh, notes on disputations because I hadn't, I haven't found that for the Faculty of Theology in Lviv. I haven't found notes that were taken during or after disputations. Uh, but my question is the following. At one point in your presentation, you say that theologians are more likely to hold on to their notes. And I was wondering uh, why that would be an, a hypothesis, because again, for the University of Leuven, that doesn't seem to be the case because we have a lot of um, manuscripts for the arts faculty. Um, but for the Faculty of Theology, um, not so much, and I think you know there's a lot of different explanations um, for that, or there could be a lot of different explanations. One of the explanations could be that we just don't recognize um, the notes as student notes, but I was just wondering um, why you um, have that as like a hypothesis. hypothesis. Well, first of all, what centuries are you working on at the University of Leuven? Um, the 16th century. Okay, so uh, I'm working on medieval, uh, right? Medieval and scholastic uh, notebooks. So that's the main difference. You're, you're probably working on humanists. And of course for humanists, no? Theology too, okay. <laughs> um, so, why did I make this hypothesis? Well, first of all, because in my preliminary research, I mostly found uh, uh, um, notebooks coming from the Faculty of Theology. And secondly, because um, theology was one of the superior uh, faculties, right? So people who went to the Faculty of Theology already had gone through the Faculty of Arts and they were pursuing a career. If you're pursuing a career, even if it's not a uh, a career at the university, you're going to hang on to your notes. You're going to hang on to your notes for preaching. You're going to hang on, hang on uh, to your notes for all sorts of other reasons. So that was my hypothesis. Now, I did manage to get some extra Romanian funding and we are also working on some case studies from the Faculty of Arts. 
and my colleagues who are mostly philosophers find them way more interesting. So, uh, <laughs> um, that was uh, uh, what my hypothesis was based on. And I'm very curious about why in Leuven you don't have uh, um, theological uh, notes. Um, the only thing that I can say for now is that um, one of the hypotheses why there's actually a lot of arts uh, notes still existent or manuscripts still existent is that um, students um, use them as a kind of unofficial proof of study. They kind of adorn them with drawings and everything to take them home with them and, and to have this kind of maybe a memory or, or kind of an official proof of study. Um, but for the Faculty of Theology, I'm still thinking about this question. Okay, maybe we can go to the next question by Yola Tsun. So good afternoon, Alexandra. I've been a fan of your project since it passed on Twitter, and I'm very happy now to hear it in the full extent, and it's marvelous what you're doing and what you will be doing in the following years. And as uh, Yarik just said, for our project, which runs parallel to Adfontes, we have the Ad Aulam project on uh, notes in the Faculty of Arts and in the Faculty of Law. And this is just great uh, comparative material. And I have a similar question as Yarik, um, but it goes, it takes a slightly different perspective because it's again this question on why do theologians hold more onto notes or, um, and this is a question of someone who's trained as a historian, you will notice. Um, but why that you prefer in your uh, definition, the word owner, the personal interest of the owner, because a lot of, of theology students, uh, whether go into, uh, as, as your examples, or in monastic orders, uh, where property, of course, is, is differently designed than we would take it uh, from today's perspective. On the other hand, even if you look at secular clergy, the ones you were just telling about, uh, taking these notes with them, um, I'm, I'm wondering the fact that these notes remain in libraries and so on and so on means that they have been passed on and on and on in families or through other traditions. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering to what extent owner is the right word in your definition and it wouldn't be better to speak of compiler and then to also think about this transmission of manuscripts whether in a monastic context or, for example, one of the, the codices we're studying is actually of a lawyer who went to the Louvain University, um, a Louvain University which is not known for his Jesuit sympathies. But then when he returned to his house or his home city, he donated all his um, notebooks to the Jesuit, to the library of the Jesuit college there. So these were, uh, for uh, to one extent, personal notes. But as soon as he was uh, in, a, in a position of patronage towards the Jesuit college, he donated these personal notebooks. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering about these associations with ownership in medieval uh, context. Well, thank you very much for your suggestion. Um, yes, I think compiler might be a better term. Usually I say uh, initial or owner to be more precise. Um, also, um, uh, you're right, of course, we have to see the transmission. It's one of the most important things to see how this uh, this uh, this manuscript that was uh, personal became communal, right? It's uh, okay. Um, what else? Um, is there anything else that you wanted to me to address? Because I'm really tired and I zoomed out a bit. <laughs> Sorry. No, but I, uh, yeah, I, it, it was linking upon that, and I'm sure we will be, be discussing these kind of, of things, but it's, it's, for, it's one of the most fascinating things, this fact that we still have these notebooks, which are supposed to be in family archives, if they're personal, but they're in all kinds of different monastic libraries or um, city libraries even. So 
um, this is something which intrigues me and uh, it will be part of other discussions as well. I think. Thank you very much for your well, suggestion and for first... your fandom on Twitter. I appreciate <laughs> it. Okay. I'm also a fan of yours, so. Okay, if there are no more questions, I would like to thank Alexandra again for her talk, for her talk.